Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virginia International University's MBA 603 Contemporary Issues and Accounting course. During this section, we're going to be talking about segment and interim financial reporting. Consolidated financial statements enable investors to assess management's overall effectiveness in managing company resources by providing useful information for computing overall measures of profitability, liquidity, efficiency, and other metrics. To help investors evaluate a company's business segment's performance, though, supplemental footnote disclosures are required. And so the first part of this session will talk about business segment reporting. Then we'll also move on to um, interim reporting, which uh, financial reporting courses, we typically deal with reporting companies' performance for a year. That's their annual report. However, many companies are also required to issue financial reports covering shorter periods of time during the year, most notably on a quarterly basis. And so we'll finish up today talking about the um, uh, focus on reporting guidelines for such interim reports. And so what we want to talk about today is to understand how the management approach is used to identify potentially reporting operating segments. We'll apply the threshold test to identify reportable operating segments, that is the revenue test, the asset test, and the operating profit test. We'll apply the 75% um, revenue test to determine whether additional segments must be reported. We want to understand the types of information that may be disclosed for segments and the reasons that the levels of disclosures may vary across companies. We'll also want to understand what segment disclosures are reconciled to uh, the consolidated amounts. Um, we'll want to know the types of enterprise-wide disclosures related to products and services or geographical areas of operations or major customers that are required to be disclosed. We'll also want to understand the similarities and differences in the reporting of operations in an interim versus an annual reporting period, and we'll talk about how we compute interim period income tax expense. So let's first talk about um, reportable operating segments. So segment reporting under GAAP applies to public business enterprises, which are defined as enterprises that have issued debt or equity securities that are traded in a public market that are required to file financial statements with the Securities and Exchange Commission or that provide financial statements for the purpose of issuing securities in a public market. Enterprises must report segment information in the same way that management organizes the enterprise into units for internal decision making and performance evaluation purposes. GAAP refers to this approach as the management approach to segmentation. The management approach relies on the concept of chief operating decision maker. The chief operating decision maker identifies a function rather than a specific person or a title. That function is allocating resources and assessing the performance of the segments of the firm. And so what we see is that reporting is based on the structure used by management to make decisions or evaluate performance. For example, if the company's internal reporting and evaluation system is geographically based, the segment reporting is geographically based. If the internal reporting and evaluation system is product line based, the segment reporting is product line based. And so how to identify these reportable segments becomes um, uh, an issue. Management approach-based segments are called operating segments, and GAAP characterizes an operating segment as a component of a business or of an enterprise that engages in business activities from which it may earn revenues and incur expenses, including intersegment revenues and expenses, um, also whose operating results are regularly reviewed by the enterprise's chief operating decision maker and for which discrete financial information is available. Some parts of the enterprise are not included in operating segments, so pensions and other post-retirement benefit plans are not operating segments. Likewise, you know, corporate headquarters or functional departments that do not earn revenues are not operating segments. One way to think about this is when we talk about responsibility centers and we talk about, well, a cost center. 
And so we talk in general, cost centers would not be determined to be operating segments, but a profit center or perhaps an investment center, which are two other types of responsibility centers, could be considered to be operating segments. The cost, I'm sorry, so um, we talked that corporate headquarters are functional departments that don't earn revenues are not operating segments. Um, and so the cost of these groups are allocated to the operating segments so that their, the cost of them or the impact of maintaining these groups are reflected in the financial statements or in the operating um, uh, segment reports. And so as we discussed that the definition of an operating segment is a component of a business enterprise that engages in business activities so it has revenues and expenses tracked and their intercompany amounts may be included. It has operating results which are reviewed by the chief operating decision maker and there are discrete financial information available about the business enterprise or component of the business enterprise. And we exclude the idea of pensions and post-retirement plans and general corporate headquarters. And so um, an enterprise may combine similar operating segments if aggregation is consistent with the objectives of the chief operating decision maker and if the segments have similar economic characteristics. So the segments must also be similar in each of the following areas. So the nature of the products and services, the nature of the production process, the type or class of customer for their products and services, the distribution method for products and services, and if applicable, the nature of the regulatory environment, such as uh, perhaps like a public utilities. And so we have these threshold tests that we need to apply to determine whether operating segments are reportable. If they meet certain materiality thresholds, then they are considered to be material and separately reportable. And so we say that the operating segments are reportable and material if any one of these threshold tests are met. So it's reportable revenue, including intersegment revenues, is 10% or more of the combined revenue of all operating segments. Or if the absolute value of its reported profit or loss is 10% or more of the greater of the combined reported profit of all operating segments that reported a profit or the absolute value of the combined reported loss of all operating segments that reported a loss. And then finally the 10% uh, asset test which says that if it is a uh, material and separately reportable if its assets are 10% or more of the combined assets of all operating segments. Once reportable segments are identified, all other operating segments are combined with other business activities in all other categories for reporting purposes. <clears throat> And so then we have this one additional test to see that if a sufficient number of segments have been identified. Reported segments must include at least 75% of all external revenue. External revenue excludes inter-segment revenue. If reportable segments do not meet this criteria, then additional segments must be identified as reportable, even if they don't meet the quantitative thresholds. So two or more of the smaller segments that were not reportable on their own may be aggregated to form a reportable operating segment only if they meet a majority of the aggregation criteria. And GAAP does not specify the number of segments that must be reported. However, too many segments would be considered overly detailed and therefore counterproductive. So although no firm limit was established, the standard encourages enterprises that identify 10 or more reportable segments to consider additional segregation uh, of their segments. I'm sorry, the uh, additional aggregation of their segments. And so here we talk um, about our 10% revenue test. So um, segment reported revenue, including intersegment revenues, is 10% or more of the combined revenue of all operating segments, then it is a separately reportable segment. 
and combined includes the all other category as well. Intersegment revenues are not eliminated so that combined revenues may be greater than consolidated revenues. And so here we have an example. And in the example, we see the different operating segments, such as transportation, oil refining, insurance, and financing. We see operating segment revenue, which is um, exclusive of intersegment revenue. And then for oil refining and insurance, we see that there is intersegment revenue. Um, we combine the intersegment revenue to get total segment revenue and then compare that to see whether or not the total segment revenue for any segment is 10% um, or more than the combined total segment revenue. And so when we look at that, we see transportation is 360 um, K of 1.5 million, so that's greater than 10%. Yes. Um, the, um, and t we can easily look at this and say 10% is um, $150,000. So any one of the total segment revenues greater than $150,000 makes it a reportable operating segment. And in this case, then, transportation and oil refining are reportable segments. And so we then have the asset test, and this involves comparing the total amount of each operating segment's assets with 10% of the total assets of all operating segments. A segment's assets are defined as those assets included in the measure of the segment's assets that are reviewed by the chief operating decision maker. General corporate assets may be included or excluded in the asset management, depending on the way management has organized the assets for operating decision making purposes. And so this gives us an example of the 10% asset account, or asset test. We see where we have the same four segments, transportation, oil, finance, insurance, and financing. And we've um, uh, identified the operating segments, identifiable assets, uh, and then which total then uh, $3 million across all um, segments. And so any segment that is has assets of greater than 10% of the three million or $300,000 becomes a reportable segment. And in this uh, example, we see transportation, oil refining, and financing uh, are reportable segments. And so then we talk about the 10% profit or loss test. And it's, a, it's an interesting to note here that no uniform definition of operating profit is required in applying this test. An operating segment's operating profit or loss depends on the revenues and expenses that management includes in the measurement reviewed by the chief operating decision maker. So in applying the operating profit test, the absolute amount of each segment's operating profit or loss is compared with 10% of the greater of the combined operating profits of all profitable operating segments or the absolute value of the combined operating losses of all unprofitable operating losses. And so here we have our example again with the same four segments, and we show there's um, segment, we have two columns, one for set operating, segment operating profit, segment operating losses. And um, we remember our rule that um, a, a reportable segment's profit or loss, that absolute value of the profit or loss, it's greater than or equal to 10% of the greater of the combined, the absolute value of the combined profit or losses uh, becomes a reportable segment. And so we see that we have um, at, that the 270k of operating profit is greater than the absolute value of the segment operating loss of 100k. 100k. So we're looking at the 270k to get the 10% threshold, which is 27% k, and so. Uh, in each case, we can say that for transportation, the absolute value of the operating loss of 100K is greater than 27K, so it's reportable. 
the 200K segment operating profit with respect to oil refining is greater than the 27K, so it's reportable. However, the insurance 20K profit is not greater than or equal to 10%, and so it would not be defined as a reportable segment, but financing with the 50K operating profit um, is greater than the 27K, and so it is a reportable segment. So in this example, transportation, oil refining, and finance are reportable segments. And so then we go through this process of testing for additional segments. And again, the goal of this is to make sure that we provide the user the financial statements with the information that they need um, to for economic decision-making purposes. Um, and we don't want the rules and the form uh, of the process to overshadow the substance. And so that's why we have this test for additional segments. So if enter uh, in the revenue test, the test value is based on 10% of the total external and intersegment revenue. If intersegment revenue is very large, some segments that make up the large percentage of consolidated revenue may not qualify for reporting under the revenue test. If these segments do not qualify for reporting under either of the other two tests, then investors will not be provided with potentially relevant information. So GAAP requires that total external revenue from a reportable operating segment be equal to at least 75% of the consolidated revenue. And so to get to this, um, we talk about uh, items like excluding intercompany, I'm sorry, intersegment revenues, add other segments until the 75% test is met, and then segments are typically aggregated so they're not more than 10 separate segments reported. And so let's review. We've performed three tests, test of revenue and test of assets and test of profits and loss. So let's review how those, um, the results of those tests stack up. Based on the 10 percent Based on the 10% revenues, 10% assets, 10% profit and loss, three reportable um, segments exist, transportation, oil refining, and financing. One non-reportable segment becomes all other, which is insurance. Now we want to check to see if the three are enough. So as we review this um, data, we see that the total revenue of all segments, including the intersegment revenue, is 1.5 million. 500,000 of that amount is intersegment, so $1 million is revenue from external customers or consolidated revenue. The external revenue of the transportation, oil refining, and finance operating segments of $905,000, that's the $360,000 in transportation plus the $405,000 in oil refining plus the $140K in financing, um, get us to $905,000 is greater than 75% of consolidated revenue, and so no additional segments need to be reported. If the 75% tests were not met, additional operating segments are added until we meet the 75% criteria. And so enterprises report limited information about products and services, geographic areas of operations, and major customers, regardless of the operating segmentation used. This additional information is only required if it is not provided as part of the reportable operating segment information. And so what we're talking about here is this idea of enterprise-wide disclosures versus segment disclosures. And so if we don't cover certain information in our segment disclosures, we need to provide that information with respect to enterprise-wide disclosures. And that's information on products and services. So they um, enterprises disclose either revenues from each product or service or group of similar products or services or the fact that it's impractical to provide this information. Enterprise-wide disclosures also include geographic information. If practical, these enterprises disclose this information, including revenues from external customers attributed to the enterprise's home country and revenues attributed to all foreign countries in total. And then major customers. So enterprises are required to disclose the existence of major customers. The fact that a single customer accounts for 10% or more of the enterprise's revenue must disclose, as well as the amount of revenue from each such customer and the segment reporting the revenue. 
Disclosure of the identity of the customer is not required. In calculating the 10% rule, the group of entities under common control count as a single customer. And so, again, here we're talking about this idea of enterprise-wide disclosures. We switch that now and we start talking about this idea of segment disclosures. GAAP requires limited segment information to be included in interim reports. However, the disclosures are required for each year for which a complete set of financial statements is presented. And so, and so we can see the um, information that's required as a reportable segment disclosures. And those include issues such as profit or loss, total assets, revenue from external customers, revenue from other operating segments, interest income and expenses, depreciation and amortization expense, unusual items, income from equity method investments, income tax expense or benefits, extraordinary items, or significant non-cash items other than depreciation. And again, what we're talking about here is segment level disclosure. So if we've identified, uh, based on one of our three tests, that is revenue, profit or loss, or assets, if we've identified as a result of those tests or the 75% rule, if we've identified that a segment needs to be uh, disclosed, it's a reportable segment, then these are the types of disclosures that also have to accompany that. And so, again, we want to keep in mind that GAAP is depending on the company's chief operating decision maker to determine the most useful information. But it's, um, you know, it's um, important to keep in mind that, again, this information is being provided to uh, financial statement users, and so it's important that uh, the information they get provides them with the level relevant information that's timely, that's accurate, and it's at a level that's useful. So whatever data is required internally will also be used for external disclosures. However, the company allocating expenses among the operating segments should be continued for external segment disclosure purposes. And so, in addition to the information provided for each segment, a reconciliation between the segment data and consolidated information must be provided for the following items. And this includes the total of the reportable segment's revenue and the reported consolidated revenue. So we have to um, reconcile our reportable segment revenue to the consolidated revenue reflected on the consolidated financial statements. The total reportable segments profit or loss and consolidated income before taxes have to also be reconciled to the consolidated uh, income before taxes. However, if items such as taxes and extraordinary items are included in segment profit or loss, segment profit or loss can be reconciled to consolidated income after these items are included. We also have to reconcile the total reportable segment's assets to consolidated assets, which may take into account a variation of maybe this idea of corporate assets that aren't on a um, segment's books but are at the corporate level that a segment uh, achieves or receives some benefit from. And then we also have to reconcile the total, total reportable segment's amounts for every other significant item of information disclosed with their corresponding consolidated amounts. And so, um, Again, we get into um, these other items that we talked about previously that have to be disclosed uh, that where we talk about um, income from tax expense or benefits, unusual items, depreciation and amortization expense, interest income and expense, revenue from other operating segments, extraordinary items. So if these other uh, segment disclosures are reported, then they also have to be reconciled to the consolidated amounts uh, for those same uh, reported amounts. 
And so we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, this idea of additional disclosures around enterprise-wide disclosures. And so these are not um, segment disclosures, but they're enterprise across the whole enterprise. And again, we talk about items that have to be reported, such as products and services, geographic information, or major customers, um, which all of this is covered in the text. And so interim financial reports provide information about a firm's operations for less than a full year. They're commonly issued on a quarterly basis and typically include cumulative year-to-date information as well as comparative information for corresponding periods of the prior year. The guidelines for interim reporting are particularly applicable to publicly traded companies that are required to prepare quarterly reports according to SEC and New York Stock Exchange requirements. Even so, GAAP guidelines apply whenever publicly traded companies issue interim financial information to their security holders. Interim reports uh, provide more timely but less complete information than annual financial reports. They reflect a trade-off between timeliness and reliability because estimates must replace many of the extensive reviews of receivables, payables, inventories, and related income effects that support the measurements presented in annual financial reports, which have to meet audit requirements. So under current GAAP, interim financial statements only require a minimum level of disclosure. Therefore, interim financial statements are usually labeled unaudited. Under GAAP, each interim period is considered an integral part of each annual period rather than a basic accounting period unto itself. Generally, interim report results should be based on the accounting principles and practices used at the latest annual financial statements, although some modifications may be needed. However, to relate the interim period to annual period results in a meaningful manner. So the gross profit method of estimating inventory and cost of goods sold, uh, you may recall from um, other intermediate accounting courses. As you will recall, the method is not acceptable for annual financial statement purposes. However, a company can use the gross profit method for interim reporting purposes when it does not use the perpetual inventory method and it is too costly to perform an inventory cost or count to cost out the inventory. Obviously, the gross profit method must yield a reasonable method of estimate of the inventory and cost of goods sold in order to be used. We also talk about uh, LIFO inventories. One reason companies use the last in first out method is to reduce taxable income and therefore taxes paid when prices are rising. The IRS requires the LIFO method used for financial reporting purposes if it is used for tax purposes. To avoid paying taxes previously avoided, companies attempt to avoid LIFO layer liquidation that results in lower cost of goods sold, higher net income, and higher tax bill. LIFO inventory labor layers may be liquidated during an interim period, but could be expected to be replaced by year end. So the amount of current cost in excess of the historical cost is shown as the current liability on the interim balance sheet. With respect to inventory market declines, permanent inventory market declines are recognized in the interim period unless they are considered temporary. And then with respect to standard cost systems, planned variances under a standard cost system that are expected to be absorbed by year end are usually deferred in the interim date. And so again, we get back to this. We want these interim reports to be realistic and to be reflective of what we expect is going to happen on an annual basis. And so we have some leeway in here uh, where we expect, uh, you know, to adjust where we expect that the annual results will be different than what the interim results suggest they will be, either as a result of temporary market declines or temporary standard cost variances or um, uh, methodologies related to how we liquidate our inventory. And so here we're talking about um, uh, other interim modifications with respect to interim reporting. So when we talk about annual expenses, um, annual expenses are allocated to the interim periods to which they relate. So major annual repair allowances are an example of this kind of allocation. 
Um, expenses arising from an interim period are not deferred unless they would be deferred a year. For example, property taxes accrued or deferred for annual purposes are also accrued or deferred for interim purposes. Then we talk about advertising expenses. Advertising costs are expensed in the interim period in which they are incurred unless the benefits clearly apply to subsequent interim periods. And then income taxes. So income taxes for interim reported are divided into two parts. One, those that are applicable to income from continuing operations before income taxes, excluding unusual or infrequently occurring items. And two, those applicable to significant unusual or infrequently occurring items, discontinued items, and extraordinary items. Income tax expense for an interim period is based on an estimated effective annual tax rate that is applied to taxable income from continuing operations, excluding unusual and infrequently occurring items. So the year-to-date tax expense, less the tax expense recognized in earlier interim periods, is the tax expense for the current interim period. Then gains and losses on discontinued operations and extraordinary items are reported as a net of tax basis as in annual reports. And so next we want to talk about um, this idea of interim period annual taxes. Or, I beg your pardon, interim period income taxes. And we have an example that we can walk through here. And so what we do in um, estimating our interim period income taxes is to estimate what our annual effective tax rate will be. And here we have a table that um, shows us, uh, it's a tax rate schedule that says, well, the taxable income is zero to but not over 50,000. We have a 15% tax rate from 50 to 75. We pay 7,500 plus 25% of the amount over 50,000 and so on and so forth till we get down to a 34% tax rate for all taxable income greater than $335,000. And so, if we, in, in reporting for interim period reporting, in this example, if we expected our annual income tax to be $100,000, our taxes are $22,000. Um, uh, if we divide that $22,250 um, divided by the $120,000, we get an effective tax rate of 22.5%. And um, that we then use the 22.5% rate for all four quarters. And so what we're saying there essentially is that, you know, we estimate what our annual tax rate is going to be, not what the tax rate is for each interim period being reported. Then we apply that estimated annual tax rate to the results of the interim report. And so then we have um, uh, both consolidated and segment financial information that's to be disclosed in interim reports. And we see here that at a minimum, publicly traded companies should report this idea of sales or gross revenues, provision for income taxes, extraordinary items, including related income tax effects, net income, and comprehensive income. They also have to report basic and diluted earnings per share data for each period presented, seasonal revenue, costs or expenses, the, dis this, the disposal of a component of an equity or extraordinary, unusual, or infrequently occurring item, contingent items, um, changes in accounting principles or estimates, significant changes in financial position, um, And then we see some other interim disclosures, which um, include things like segment information disclosures are reduced for interim reporting. Uh, certain information about defined benefits plans don't need to be reported. Certain information about um, the uh, use of fair value measurements, derivatives, and other financial instruments or information about uh, impairments. And so we see that, um, you know, this um, uh, segment and interim reporting is a very significant area and takes a lot of effort and um, uh, work on behalf of the um, organization to stay current with it and to um, uh, provide the information in a way that's useful to shareholders uh, and economic decision makers and that meets the requirements. 
And so the SEC requires that quarterly reports be prepared for the company's stockholders and for filing with the SEC. These reports are to be prepared using GAAP and are filed on Form 10-Q within 40 days after the end of the quarter for accelerated filers and 45 days after the end of the quarter for all others. Fourth quarter reports are not required, but the SEC Rule 14A-3 requires inclusion of selected quarterly data in the annual report to shareholders. Quarterly reports are not audited, so the CPA report states that a review rather than an audit has been performed. And so in Chapter 15, we talk about this idea of disclosures that are required for each reportable operating segment, uh, which include a description of the types of products and services sold, a product or loss measure used internally to evaluate the segment, and total assets. Other disclosures on revenues, expenses, gains, losses, and assets may be made if these amounts are included in the profit or loss and segment assets measures reviewed by the chief operating decision maker. Reportable segment data are reconciled with the enterprise's consolidated amounts. Limited segment information is also disclosed in quarterly reports. GAAP also requires disclosures on an enterprise-wide basis, so a company must disclose information about its products and services, geographic areas, and major customers unless the information is included as part of the segment disclosures. Finally, GAAP for interim financial report disclosures help to assure that interim financial statements reports provide timely information. However, much of that information is based on estimates and the reports are unaudited. So each interim period is considered an integral part of the annual period. As a result, interim period information is based on the accounting principles used in the last annual report. However, some modifications at the interim reporting date may be necessary so that the interim period results complement the annual results of operations. And so that takes care of chapter 15 and this idea of segment reporting and interim reporting, but it is a very important chapter. And um, so I encourage you to go back and read it and make sure you're comfortable with everything that it's, that is presented in it and um, uh, be comfortable with the, um, the tests that need to be met for segment disclosures, the types of information that need to be presented, and then this idea of interim reporting and what needs to be reported there, the reconciliation if necessary, um, and you know, the other key information in the chapter. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you.